Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening on Hong Kong Stock Market, Understanding Chinese Investment Opportunities. I'm Crystal, the Community Manager at Prosperous. Let me introduce our speakers for tonight. We have Tin, Prosperous Head of Content and Investment Lead with over 10 years of content experience in the financial industry, including stints at Schroders and the Motley Fool. Tim believes that successful long-term investing is within everyone's reach. Next up, we have Samuel. Samuel is with the CJCIMB China Solutions team with a focus on the Hong Kong and China markets across an array of product classes such as equities, CFDs, futures, and forex. Last but not least, Ping Mei, founder of Prosperous, who has over 12 years of experience in financial services, she started her career in transformation at a regional bank and subsequently moved on to CIMB Securities, now known as CGS CIMB Securities, in 2014. As the Group Head of Strategy and Analytics for CGS CIMB, she is passionate about growing prosperous into a leading digital investment platform for the new generation of investors. Prosperous is a digital investment service launched this March to cater for the millennials. We aim to provide you with the best in-class service and to allow millennials to gain more insights on investing, we have specially created webinar series. So with Prosperous, you will not only learn how to invest, but also curate, enjoy curated lifestyle experiences at the same time. Looking to invest on the go? Check out our recently launched Prosperous app on Google Play and App Store today. Follow us on our social media like Instagram or Telegram to keep yourselves updated on the latest news. So without further ado, let's start tonight's session. Samuel, over to you. Okay, thanks, Crystal. So without further ado, I'll begin. All right. So everything said here is just for education purpose and does not constitute to any form of financial advice, right? So without further ado, let's start. And before we start, I would like actually to ask all the audience out there. I'm sure you all invested in one way or another, but have you all, all invested in a particular product or have you all spreaded your investments across an array of products? And if you are not in that already investing in an array of products, what will make you do to invest in one? Is it the growth, the stability of it, or are you looking for the future economy or maybe a market leader? Well, many of us have different ideas on what we want in our investment portfolio. And definitely, we do not want to have all in one market, like maybe example, all in Singapore. By spreading our eggs across different baskets, we are not only diversifying our assets, but we are also negating the risk in terms of the systematic risk in our portfolio. So with that, I'm sure many of you all have heard about Chinese stocks. Chinese stocks have been in the news for the past few months. Whether is it for the right reasons or the wrong reasons, definitely we have heard of them. And many of us are right now very interested in it. Why? Because we are thinking that, oh, the big names have dropped to an all-time low. Oh, the big names have fallen quite a bit. Is it the right time to look at it? Well, before we actually even begin looking at these individual names, we should try to understand what uh, the different listing requirements are, as well as buying into which kind of countries in terms of the Chinese stocks will matter to us. So definitely for Chinese names, they are listed both onshore and offshore, and onshore meaning in China itself, and offshore is in uh, more, region, more uh, well-known regions like Hong Kong and US. Each of them have their pros and cons as stated in the table below. And I think that many of us would like to know which is the right one for us to invest. Right now, definitely investing into China has its pros because of the fact that uh, there's a wider range of sectors in China markets itself, and there are more localized companies if you want to do stock picks. However, investors may be unfamiliar with it. And for the Hong Kong markets, why people are looking at it is because many prominent Chinese brands are listing there. And right now, it's actually exempted the stricter IPO rules that China has put in place for the US listings. But however, Hong Kong has a unique geopolitical situation, and this also makes it a little risky. For US side, US side, I mean, it's the most common markets, and everybody knows that uh, a lot of prominent Chinese companies have 
started to list there for cross-listing premiums. However, with the increased scrutiny in US listings, people may want to think twice whether they want to invest in the US. So we can see that Chinese stocks are to face uh, headwinds. Not only is it being scrutinized by the Chinese government, the US SEC is also giving Chinese companies a hard time. They have uh, increased the regulations for Chinese companies to do IPO disclosures, as well as they stated that if Chinese companies do not conform to the regulations, what happens is that they will force these Chinese companies to deduce. And we all know that China cyberspace regulations have made it more difficult for companies to list in the US. So where will these Chinese companies list in going forth? Well, more Chinese companies have started to look at listing in Hong Kong, and this makes Hong Kong a very attractive market to look at. Why? It's because if we look at the latest note as seen in the regulations listed by the Chinese government, it stated that it did not specifically list Hong Kong markets as part of the markets they are scrutinizing. And so this would give actually Hong Kong markets uh, more opportunities. And we can see that a number of names have started to uh, want to list in Hong Kong as well. So, uh, so with that in mind, Hong Kong's markets is looking uh, more open and more attractive. Hong Kong market right now is already very liquid. You can see that in terms of market cap, it's actually the fourth largest in the world. Okay, this is uh, aside from US and China. It is also very liquid, and we can see that its liquidity is actually uh, as liquid as the S&P, or more liquid than the Dow. This is looking at the one-year horizon in terms of the daily volumes being traded. And we can see that it's definitely much more liquid than at the STI. So good liquidity means that it's easier to encash your position should you want to liquidate your position. There's also strong inflow coming in from overseas markets into Hong Kong. So we can see that actually Chinese investors towards Hong Kong equities have grown exponentially. So we are looking at the southbound market cap, whereby we all know for the Stock Connect, there's a northbound and southbound. Southbound actually tracks how much Chinese investors are investing into Hong Kong markets. So with southbound holdings nearly doubling in two years, we can see that it's actually showing that more and more Chinese citizens are being are interested in Hong Kong markets and are investing in Hong Kong markets itself. So by investing in Hong Kong markets, you are actually not one of the front runners, but you are actually following most of the people who are finding Hong Kong markets more and more attractive. So if we don't catch the wave right now, by the time you start looking at Hong Kong markets, if you, it may be too late. If you do not sort of like start planning or start looking into Hong Kong markets right now. So why invest into Hong Kong markets? Well, actually, I summarize it into three points, which I will briefly touch before explaining more into that later. Firstly, it's a gateway to tap on Chinese gro China's growth prospects. Second, it provides diversification benefits. And third, it actually consists of various unique sectors. So before I actually delve deeper into it, I'll pass the time on to Tim, who can explain a little bit more first. Tim, please. Thanks, Samuel. Okay, so um, I think you know he gave a, uh, Samuel gave a pretty good overview of uh, why you should invest in Hong Kong. Um, I'll just kind of take a look at the main index in Hong Kong, which is uh, the Hang Seng Index. So that's sort of like the Straits Times equivalent, but in Hong Kong. So it has all your big uh, banks, all your big uh, property developers, uh, all your big tech companies. Um, it is actually dominated mainly by financial stocks, uh, as you can see um, on the right hand side chart. Uh, although that weighting used to be close to 50%. So more recently, uh, the, the, the weightings of the, the component stocks has shifted and we've had a bit more of the technology giants have a bit more of an influence on the, on the index, which is a good thing, I think. Um, and obviously this is to reflect the changing composition, right? I mean, China is a massive part. I mean, Hong Kong is a part of China. So the, the Chinese stock market or the Chinese companies that are listed in Hong Kong make up, you know, 80 to 90% of the uh, total market cap. So it, it's natural for that to, um, to be reflected, but there are still way too many losers in the index makeup. So anything in the properties and construction, um, and a lot of the financials are, you know, um, they're, they're, they're pretty terrible companies, um, that probably shouldn't touch, uh, ever. Um, so they're on the way down. So they're in the dying industries and they'll probably, you know, continue to fall in terms of the representation of the index. Uh, yeah, next slide. Uh, 
Um, okay, so there are various stock types in Hong Kong. I'm sure you've heard of, um, you know, hate shares. Um, I'm sure you've heard of VIEs and all these types of, um, you know, variable interest uh, entities. Um, I'm just going to take you through the basics. So Hong Kong Ordinary is just, you know, your typical Hong Kong share class. Uh, a red chip is actually a Chinese company that's incorporated and listed outside mainland China, um, but has operations uh, on the mainland or its you know, main base of operations on the mainland. So for example, you have something like um, you know, China Mobile is only listed in Hong Kong. Uh, Lenovo is only listed in Hong Kong, although Lenovo is now thinking of listing in, uh, in China as well. Um, so there are quite a few companies that have just a Hong Kong listing that are Chinese, but aren't listed in the A shares market. So A shares uh, refers to the Chinese online onshore markets, which include Shanghai and Shenzhen. Um, and so H share, uh, moving on to H share, that is just the Hong Kong equivalent of a A share listed company. So you have Ping An Insurance A, which is listed in China, uh, in Shanghai, and then the H share is Ping An Insurance H share, which is listed in Hong Kong. So. The H share is effectively just the Hong Kong uh, listed shares of a, a, an A share, a version that's listed in mainland China. And then the others, you know, they're all the tech giants. So Meituan, Alibaba, Tencent, they're the ones who make up the, uh, the VIE structures, which is the uh, refers to the others uh, in this in this chart there. Um, so, yeah, that, that's a pretty uh, quick overview of the different types of stocks that you have to be uh, aware of. Um, next slide. Yeah, so the minimum lots can vary. Uh, so this is a quirk of Hong Kong. So I know in Singapore, we have lot sizes of 100, and it doesn't matter whether you buy, say, I don't know, you know, Capital Land Integrated Commercial, it's 100. If you buy DBS, it's 100. If you buy UOB, it's 100. But in Hong Kong, all the companies actually have different lot sizes. Um, so the minimum lot can vary quite wildly between different names. So it's important to check when you do are interested in buying a, a share in Hong Kong or a stock in Hong Kong, what is the minimum lot size? Because obviously that can impact um, your decision on how much uh, sort of capital to deploy into that name. Uh, so for example, 10 cents uh, lot size is 100. So at its current price, it's around what, 46,000 Hong Kong. So you're talking about maybe um, sort of like 7,000 Sing, over 7,000 Sing. So it's, it's a decent amount of money. So you have to keep these things in mind when you do uh, deploy your capital into the Hong Kong market. Um, yeah, next slide, please. So thanks, Tim. So I'll uh, uh, take yeah. the form here. Okay, no problem. I'll, I'll drop off now and let uh, Samuel take over. All right, so thanks, Tim. So uh, just to explain the three points that I said earlier, so Hong Kong is often seen as a proxy to China. So why is Hong Kong seen as a proxy to China? It's because over 50% of the uh, HSI constituents are actually Chinese-based. So we can see from the chart below over here, we can see that uh, these, are the these are the percentage of the companies uh, which actually uh, are based in Hong Kong and China itself. So you can see that one in red is actually around 60% of these companies are actually based in China. And of which, if we look at those based in Hong Kong, the 30 members, which is uh, the 30 members here, I've listed out the 30 members, those highlighted in red all have Chinese exposure. They have Chinese businesses, like AIA Group, whereby most of its business right now is from China, and it's actually venturing into the China market. We can see Hong Kong Stock Exchange, which is also dependent on Chinese volume as well. And like example, your China Mobile and China Meng Liu. Okay. So all of these have Chinese links. And therefore, the Hong Kong market is often used to tap into China, which is seen less accessible. Why is China less accessible? Is because you have to trade through the Stock Connect for now, unless you are unless you are a local Chinese trading in China itself. If you are trading from an offshore market, you have to trade through the Stock Connect. And not all of the all of the available A shares are tradable via the Stock Connect. Hence, it's right now less accessible, and people often use Hong Kong as a proxy to China. And we can see in what is happening in terms of the market movements as well. So I'll just show you an example of the A15 movement. All right, we can see the A15 movement from 2006 all the way to recently. We can see that there were definitely ups and downs and it's affected by a number of uh, global events such as your global financial crisis or when China raised the bank reserve requirement back in 2010 or the China reform in 2000, or the margin reform in 2015 or more recently, the regulatory scrutiny. 
So we can see that this resulted in Chinese markets to tumble. However, by uh, Chinese markets tumble, we can see that right now in 2021, the self is actually quite similar to 2015, which is actually regulatory based. And if you look at the Hong Kong markets, the pattern is very similar. It's also affected by similar events. And we can see that it's more impacted by debt related as well as China related events. So you can see that, like example, when the Chi Chinese bank uh, have the margin reform and right now with the, with the regulatory scrutiny, the downside risk is even greater than that of the Sino trade war or even the COVID situation, uh, two years and one years respectively. So we can see that Chinese markets are definitely Hong Kong markets are definitely very correlated to Chinese markets. And Tim, for you? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so Samuel's right. Yeah, I mean, I think it, the important point for me is that um, I don't tend to go down the passive investment route in Hong Kong because you have a lot of like garbage companies in the index. Um, so I prefer to avoid all the rubbish because you don't want to invest in stuff that's going to destroy your wealth. You kind of, when you invest, you generally want to grow your money. Um, so there are lots of companies in the index which have destroyed wealth. So it's preferable if you can to avoid that wealth destruction. Uh, and so going active is the best way to do that. It basically means picking your own stocks. Um, and it's not very hard to do because if you just avoid like big banks and, you know, a lot of the other rubbish that's in there, um, you'll do well. Um, so if you look at the SPX, uh, the S&P 500 over the past 10 years, so this is a 10 year chart, you can see the total return um, is more than triple the Hong Kong index. I mean, the, you know, the, the Straits Times is the worst of all three. Um, but the Hang Seng Index is around 100% total return over 10 years, which uh, when you look at the S&P is quite poor. Um, so effectively, you know, I, I tend to think when I invest, if I'm trying to pick stocks and I'm investing actively, if I can't beat the S&P 500, there's really no point to investing or picking my stocks. I may as well just buy an S&P 500 ETF, uh, stick it in there and, you know, get your, your return over the, over the long term because, um, the, the mentality is, you know, that we try and be active a lot and try and pick and, you know, kind of trade in and out. But if you actually track your performance and how well you do, um, I think it's important that you benchmark yourself against something so that you, uh, you have an idea of how well you're performing. Uh, and it gives you a bit more of an incentive as well to, uh, to be disciplined. So, um, so that's my advice. I think if you do go into the Hong Kong market, do uh, be active, don't buy an ETF. Um, because the ETFs are usually full of a lot of really, really bad companies. Um, yeah. Thanks, Samuel. All right. All right. Thanks, Steve. So we can see that why China is still uh, going strong, aside from it being a proxy to uh, Hong Kong being a proxy to China, China still have a strong growth advantage. We can see that it's the strongest among its peers in terms of if you are, lo are looking at GDP growth, etc. We can see that last year itself, the GDP growth for China is 18.3%. This is much greater than a lot of uh, developed countries which recorded negative GDP growth, as well as the US which only recorded a 0.4% year-on-year growth. And we can see that aside from that, the World Bank is also very bullish on uh, the Chinese growth story going forth. And it lifted Chinese growth forecast while slashing that of uh, East Asia as well as the Pacific region. This shows that it feels that China's growth uh, still have more momentum going forth. And right now, the World Bank actually expects China to grow at 8.5% this year as compared to the, its earlier forecast of 8.1%. So this is actually a significant uh, assurance that ch the Chinese growth story is still intact and China is still poised to grow further in terms of its economic growth. Well, like just now, remember we were saying about diversification? So when we look at diversification, definitely the Hong Kong shares and global indices are quite diversified because there's no correlation. You can look, comparing Hong Kong shares to the world indices, the correlation is just 0.3%. This provides huge diversification benefits. And if you're investing in the US and Singapore already, you can consider adding uh, Hong Kong stocks to your portfolio because this will help you make your portfolio more diverse. So moving on, like stated, there were very there are many unique sectors in Hong Kong, and definitely we can consider them because uh it's something that is not 
present in some of the work, some of the various uh, stock markets. So the first one is definitely the technology sector. The technology sector uh, have been in the spotlight of it due to the regulatory risks. And this sector has been a market darling in the past due to the growth potential. So I'm sure you have heard of all of these names, Alibaba, Tencent, Meituan, and Xiaomi. And this is definitely very linked to the Chinese tech economy. And maybe Tim can share some of his views about how he feels these companies are going to fare. Um, yeah, so I, um, I think when you talk about the market crackdown, um, a lot of people either think this is a really great buying opportunity for these tech giants or, you know, they're very uh, sort of anti the whole China, which is, so you have either one extreme or the other. Um, I I'm, tend to be kind of in the middle. I actually think there are lots of great opportunities, um, as Samuel will probably share with you uh, in following slides as well in Hong Kong. There are lots of different sectors and companies that have great potential. Um, I, I don't think that tech is one of those company if one of those sectors right now um i don't think it will change uh, i'm an ex you know sort of 10 cent shareholder myself so i um you know i'm not against these companies i think they're great companies but if you think about the sort of scrutiny that they've attracted um i don't think it's worth really the regulatory overhang that it's gonna sort of plague these names for quite a few quite a few years i think because if you want to get big tech exposure um, and you want outsized returns, you may as well just buy like Microsoft or Amazon or Apple, um, and they don't have the regulatory overhang that these guys have. Um, plus, they also have way bigger TAMs, right? It's a total addressable market. They operate globally, whereas these guys operate in China. China is a big market, but you've got 1.4 billion and they're serving, you know, a tech market that that size. If you talked about the giant guys, they're serving the rest of the world and the US. So that's like 5 billion people. So if you think about the TAM, actually of these tech giants in the US, it's way more attractive than the times of these like tech giants in China. And you don't have to deal with the Chinese government and the politics. So that to me is just too much of a headache. Um, so I tend to avoid that. Um, and then let's talk about Alibaba being a great, great buy. Um, you know, it's got really good um, sort of, you know, potential in the cloud space. That's great. Everyone talks about how big the cloud is and how big it's gonna be. Um, although the cloud market in China, if we remember, is actually still at very early stages. So how it plays out and how it gets monetized at this point isn't completely clear yet. Um, so if you look at the latest earnings from Baba, like their cloud business makes up less than 10% of their overall top line, um, which is their revenue. So if you think about where that growth is gonna come from, I think that is really, really uncertain with Baba at this point. Um, beyond that, there's a lot more competition in the e-commerce sector. It's really fiercely competitive in China. You have PDD, Pindodo, you have JD, um, you have Meituan moving into like grocery. Um, you have a lot of different players in that space. And I think Baba is kind of behind the curve on a lot of that stuff, especially in social commerce, in, in tier three, tier four cities, where the likes of PDD have really taken a lead. Um, and so it's fiercely competitive. And so that's their bread and butter still, right? And so I don't think that, is going to change too much, um, and I don't get that excited by the whole um, the whole story. I think of Baba. Plus, they just got fined about twelve billion dollars or whatever it was. So you never know with these tech giants. They've got cash to I mean, basically got a load of cash. So there's nothing for the Chinese government to not say. I want you to you know contribute this. I want you to contribute that because you've got massive amounts of cash on your balance sheet. So I think the smaller tech guys, actually in the mid cap, small cap, uh, mid cap, large cap, not the mega cap, are in a much better position to benefit from this crackdown because the playing field will be leveled. Uh, they won't be in the spotlight and they haven't got cash for the Chinese government to really just bleed them. So I think that's the way that I think about it. And the gains that you're gonna get from the Babas and the 10 cents are not gonna be as attractive as the gains you get from say a company that is maybe 10 or $20 billion market cap, for those guys to get a $100 billion market cap, they have to 5X, right? So that's a pretty good return, 5Xing. If you think about a Baba or a Tencent 5Xing, that's going to get them up to a, a market cap of two and a half trillion. So do you see them being worth more than Apple or Microsoft? Uh, I personally don't. They're not within the next sort of five, 10 years. So I think the opportunity set in other parts of the market in Hong Kong is much, much more attractive. Thanks, Samuel. All right. Thanks, Tim. So for the other unique sectors, we can see is the sports equipment sector. So we can see that right now, 
uh, there is increasing popularity due to, due to the rise of China trade fashion uh, in China and Hong Kong as well. And we can see that there's a lot of benefits from nationalism over the foreign manufacturers' comments over Xinjiang. So this has resulted in Anta and Li Ning to actually uh, rise, uh, rise in the past few months. We can also see that not only that, Anta and Li Ning is also becoming a global sports brand as well. In the recent Olympics, uh, not only is Anta sort of like uh, used for the Chinese uh, sports men and sports women's uh, jerseys, they were also used by other countries as well. And it shows that maybe the sports equipment sector in China is becoming more and more recognized. All right, we can also see that other unique sectors will be the technology equipment. So you may not be very familiar with this sector because a lot of the names are quite uh, foreign to especially people who do not invest in the Hong Kong markets. Well, China has been actually pushing for the localization of semiconductors and it's currently the world's largest manufacturing hub producing around 36% of world's electronics. So because of that, the technology equipment in Hong Kong is quite unique and people are looking towards it to do growth going forth. In fact, a lot of these companies are actually producing uh, parts for phones that you, you, you and I both use. So for example, like Sunny Optical, Sunny Optical actually produces the handphone, the handphone camera modules for iPhone. And for Q Technology, it produces the, iPhone ca the camera modules for Android-related phones like your Samsung as well as your Huawei. So for AAC and SMIC, they are more of a cheap name, semiconductor names. And with the Chinese government pushing for localization of semiconductors, this can be quite interesting to look at, especially right now with the semiconductor shortage globally. And this is one of the most unique sectors in Hong Kong that is really very unique to Hong Kong because there is no other uh, gaming uh, sort of like sector globally. We can see that even if Singapore, if you look at the gaming sector, it's only maybe like one stop, which is Genting. Well, if you're looking at the Hong Kong side, Hong Kong has many Macau gaming related stocks. And this is a unique sector because Macau's economy is heavily reliant on this sector. However, we recently saw headwinds amid the proposed revision to the casino law. And we can see that COVID has actually uh, hit this business very strongly because it has limited uh, foreigners to come to Macau to gamble. So some of the companies in Macau uh, in the gaming sector will include like Galaxy Entertainment and Sense China as well as uh, Win Macau. So with that, I'll pass the time on to Tim who can maybe share with you all a little bit about how he finds about the casino sector. Thanks, Samuel. Yeah, so um, as I was saying earlier, uh, when I talked about the Hang Seng Index, there are lots of losers in the uh, index, which you tend to uh, want to avoid. Um, one of the great examples of the big losers over the past 10 years has been property developers. Um, so that's not too dissimilar to Singapore, actually, where you've got uh, the likes of uh, city developments or CDL um, and, you know, Capital Land pre the pre its uh, restructuring recently. Um, they've been below par, um, to say the least. And I think that's kind of the same situation in Hong Kong, um, mainly because in Hong Kong, a lot of the um, property prices um, you know, I think there's a disconnect between property prices uh, and then the share prices of the developers that are developing that property. So Hong Kong is obviously really well known for skyrocketing house prices. And so that, you know, benefits um, obviously the property developers and their and their tycoons. Um, and to be honest, um, they've always traded at a massive discount to NAV. So you hear people say, oh, they're trading at a 55 percent or 60 percent discount to NAV. You've got to buy them. Um, yeah, but they'd always trade at that range. They've always done that. They've never really traded above that. Um, so they're cheap for a reason because they're poor investments. Um, and what they do is they're very capital intensive. They require a lot of capital to build and to develop the, their properties. Um, and they don't tend to, to reward their shareholders. You know, a lot of them have a lot of cash on the balance sheet um, and they don't really reward their shareholders. And so what you've seen is that institutional uh, sort of investors have just deserted this market. Uh, and you've seen share prices move pretty much sideways or down for the past decade. Um, and they're losing their clout because most people realize they're terrible investments. Uh, and so if there's one, you know, sort of area to stay away from in Hong Kong, it is definitely property developers. Don't, don't touch them. Um, they're, they're really toxic. Uh, second, I would say, you know, Macau, I think uh, Samuel touched on. It's a unique sector. Um, there is a gaming sector kind of in the U.S. as well that is dealing a bit more on the online 
Um, but again, with regulation and with the crackdown in China, I just think it's one of those sectors that is not really going to get a lot of love. Um, if you think about the behavior that Xi Jinping wants the Chinese people to be partaking in, um, gambling is certainly not one of them, right? So if you think about common prosperity, if you think about um, you know, where he wants to take the country, um, he doesn't want people gambling and he doesn't want people gambling um, you know, online either. So I think you know, these guys are maybe behind the curve. They're maybe like, you know, sort of like the property developers of this decade that, you know, they had a great run, uh, probably, you know, 2009 to 2014. But all those, all the share prices of those guys haven't reached the highs they did in 2014, um, which is just before Xi Jinping, you know, cracked down on corruption, because obviously there's a lot of money laundering in going on in Macau um, that goes through China and it goes through, through Macau as well. So I think the link between the corruption and that, you know, it kind of got it got shut down by Xi, by President Xi. Um, but now trying to get people in, uh, it doesn't look like China is going to open up for a while. Um, and that obviously applies to Macau and to Hong Kong. So to see whether the border opens with China and Macau is just is really touch and go. And it's completely reliant on China and Chinese policy. So, again, um, I think it's one of those that will never really reach um, the heights that it did previously. Yeah, next slide, please. All right, so I'll just cover the, oh, this, uh, okay. this last unique sector as well. So this last unique sector actually is the automotive sector, whereby we can see that the ele electric vehicle market has been growing rapidly with many nations jumping on the trend. So this sector is expected to benefit from China's carbon neutrality push, and we can see that uh, China in its five year plan has been focusing on carbon neutrality very strongly. So some of the examples of uh, the automotive sector will be BYD. Uh, BYD is actually very, uh, it's very applicable to our local scene as well. You can see that uh, many of the electric buses uh, by transits, by our bus companies is actually by BYD. Also, we can see other companies like uh, Great World Motor, Gili, which is get, gaining popularity. Lastly, Xperm, which uh, was uh, very popular in the US and it recently just listed in Hong Kong as well. So, yep. All right, I think there's a little bit of an oops moment here because the question to speakers is showing. <laughs> Apologies <laughs> for that. Yeah, so we actually wanted to uh, get a little view. Uh, the, the topic of uh, electric vehicles is really, I think, popular definitely globally as well. I mean, everyone's been watching the likes of Tesla and so many Chinese EV companies have you know, also been listed and they've also seen the rise in their share prices, I think in the past uh, one and a half years. So I think the question to the speakers, as you guys can see, is of course, we know EVs are a mega trend to watch in the coming years, but how do you think these Chinese EV companies can compete globally against the likes of Tesla, as well as a lot of the traditional auto companies you know, that's really been moving to this space, right? We see the likes of Volkswagen, General Motors, I think even Geely, which is uh, more of a traditional auto company in, in China, but have recently been making a big push into the EV sector as well. So how do you think they stack up globally? And are they obviously a good long-term uh, investment? Um, Tim, do you want to start first? Yeah, well, um, I think EVs are a really exciting area for China just because, um, you know, the Chinese government has made... Um, environmental uh, protection, one of its you know, key goals, I think mainly to do with um, you know, power generation, electricity generation, and moving towards clean energy. Um, so it's definitely an area that I think has got a lot, of, uh, a lot of potential. I think at this point in time, you know, there are some key, there are some key um, companies like NEO and XPEG and, and BYD that are leading, but there are way too many um, EV companies in China right now. Uh, I think that was also sort of... Um, highlighted by one of the you know cabinet ministers in, in China in the past month or so just saying that there will be consolidation so there is definitely going to be um, you know bankruptcies and consolidation in, in the sector so it's still maybe unclear at this point who is going to be the big winner or who's going to be sort of the Tesla of China that's just going to be you know absolutely crush it I don't think at this point you can tell um, but I think it's exciting and I think there's a whole ecosystem of um, you know, the supply chain that they're building in China as well around EVs, you know, there are lots of interesting companies, um, a couple listed in, in China that are supplying a lot of these EV companies and the components and all that. So I think the, the potential is there. Um, I think BYD is one that's really interesting because it has its own, uh, you know, auto cars as well, but it also supplies the batteries. 
to a lot of other um, OEMs. So I think they've got a bit more diversification and protection in terms of developing their own battery technology, um, which you know maybe a Neo hasn't really got that in that moat. Um, and then you've got the massive uh, sort of you know contemporary Ampex Cat L, which is like CATL, which is listed in Ch in China and Asia. So that's the biggest world's biggest um, sort of electric EV battery maker, uh, and that's an exciting an exciting market. But I think BYD, you know. What's his name? Warren Buffett invested it in it back in 2009. I'm sure he's made a pretty sum from his investments so far. Um, and it's it's been a great, great sort of stock to hold over the past two, three years. Um, so I think there's definitely a lot of potential, but I don't know where they would come, where the winners will be in the pure auto sector. Samuel, what's your right. take on it? I actually agree with Tim on most of the ecosystems in China. And I think that for uh, China, Chinese, uh, automotive companies, especially the EV sector, is more of the supply chain issue that people are, are looking at. And China has tried to integrate its supply chain in the Chinese markets itself. Because right now, like what I stated earlier, the China government is uh, actually looking at localization. And so a lot of this uh, battery auto parts, be it the lithium batteries, be it the battery supply chains, are all manufactured and produced in China. And they are supplied to their own uh, Chinese companies. Definitely, they do ship overseas as well. And what happens is that a lot of these Chinese companies, especially those uh, making their uh, cameras, the car cameras, as well as the batteries, a lot of them are suppliers to maybe your giants like Tesla, etc. So even though they may not be the ones or the global brand names that people are looking at, but however, because they are shipping all of these various parts to the respective giant, global giants right now, they still have relatively uh, upside potential if you're looking at it. And meanwhile, if you are looking at brand loyalty, then definitely if uh, you are a Chinese consumer, you'll be looking at Chinese related brands because right now China is actually pushing for a lot of uh, produce local and use local. And therefore, I think that companies like BYD, Geely, or even Great Wall Motors is going to excel in terms of its sales in China going forth as well. Okay. Um, I think there's a question that just came in. I thought we might as well bring it up. And there's a question about how about Korea EV market compared to China EV market? Anyone has a take on uh, the Korean market here? I mean, if you are looking at the Korean markets, then definitely it will be uh, your Samsung, which is trying to produce your batteries and trying to come into the smart, to the, uh, the smart uh, car electric vehicle market. However, if we look at in terms of the Chinese vehicle markets, it's right now more advanced in terms of the battery production, as well as there are various uh, new uh, alternative battery me mechanisms that they're looking at, like your sodium batteries. And I think that uh, Chinese technology is also getting more advanced. It, uh, and definitely is comparable to, uh, to Korea. But that being said, right now in terms of the supply chain and where all the rare minerals are, I think uh, uh, China still have a slight advantage from that. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, I have nothing to add to that. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Back to you, uh, Tim. Oh, yeah. Sorry, gone. Um, I guess next slide. Yep. Yeah. So again, there's a lot of, you know, um, I, I'll address this later. I mean, I think, I think, you know, I'm, I'm a bit negative at this point, but there are, tr promise you, there are, there are companies I like in Hong Kong. So I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but in terms of, you know, cheap is cheap. I like to say cheap is cheap because it's cheap for a reason. Um, they tend to be bad businesses. They tend to be um, state-owned enterprises, which don't hold shareholder interests uh, to heart. So avoid the big banks, uh, avoid big oil and gas, uh, you know, Sino, PetroChina, Sinopec, ICBC, um, you know, Agricultural Bank of China, Bank of China, CCB, avoid them because they're the big banks. They are basically levers for the Chinese government. So um, they've been terrible the past decade and they'll probably be terrible for the next decade. So avoid them. Um, next slide. Yeah. So as I said, there are great companies out there. So I like to look at companies that are actually going to have a lot of support or maybe not policy support, but are just naturally in good sectors in China. So, for example, consumer discretionary uh, spending, what Samuel had highlighted earlier, um, sort of like the Anta sports, the Li Ning, they kind of are becoming the Nikes of China. They're becoming, um, you know, sort of the athleisure, the sportswear type of type of uh, go to brands. 
And the best thing is about those companies is they built a D 2 C, so a direct to consumer model. So they're not selling on your Taobao's anymore. Are they? I mean, they are in some ways, but they're also going directly to the consumer and, and bypassing these third party marketplaces because it makes much more sense to their margins and to their business, and it's a lot more profitable. So Nike had figured that out in the U.S., and now these guys are starting to figure it out in China, and that's become, you know, a big driving force of their share prices, which have just you know, obviously destroyed it in the past five years. They've done really, really well, uh, much better than the tech giants, I would, I would also highlight. Um, and that also aligns with President Xi, right? He wants the nation to be healthy. China has the highest rate of diabetes in the world. You need to bring healthcare costs down with an aging population. Exercise is positive. It helps people, you know, feel better. It's good for you. You know, you, you avoid the obesity, you avoid the di diabetes, you avoid all these afflictions. And so, that is a great, great um, sort of sector in China because of the whole aging thing, the whole, you know, being good for your body, being good for individuals, um, making people happy. So I think that's a great area. Um, there are select financials. I mean, AIA is one that, you know, Samuel had highlighted. I think it's just starting its expansion into China. It's got a great Asian business as well, which is diversified away from China. So you've got a bit less um, risk concentration just on China. They have about 50% of their... Uh, value of new businesses outside of China in its latest uh, first half. So you think about that, it's a great growth story just for middle-class Asians who just want to buy insurance, um, but with exposure to the China growth story as well. Uh, and healthcare, you know, there's some great companies in the healthcare sector, which are serving um, the, the Chinese population, which is aging fast uh, and which needs, you know, needs, you know, affordable healthcare as well. Um, and you've got to understand what, you know, Papa Xi wants, you, you know, he has to, you have to be on the right side of him. If you're not on the right side of him, um, you know, it's going to be bad news for you, for your portfolio. Thanks. Next, next slide. I think I'm done. Or am I done? Is it your turn, Simon? Uh -huh. Oh, no. Yeah. So winners, I, I like to say this. So winners tend to win, right? They, winners tend to keep winning uh, and losers, they tend to keep losing. So if you look at HSBC, if you look at um, Henderson Land, if you look at, you know, all these terrible companies, they tend to keep losing because um, they're not good businesses. And so the fundamentals will tell out over time. Um, and so if you had bought, you know, HSBC at 2000, in 2007, 2008, before the financial crisis, you'd be down about 80, 90% now on your investment, right? So um, I think it's important to remember that you need to go with the companies that are going in the right direction, which are the future. And the companies that are in the past, um, just leave them in the past. Yeah, don't buy them, don't touch them. Um, let other people buy them, but don't you don't buy them yourself because that is going to be detrimental to your wealth in the future. And so investing is about buying things that are, um, are going to grow your wealth, right? So, so buy the future, buy things that are going to win and that are going to continue to win. Um, it's difficult because it's not natural to just add to those things that keep going up, um, but it's much better than adding to you the things that are going to keep going down because that all that's going to do is um, is erode your your wealth and we don't want that to happen when we invest. Thank you very yeah. much, Tim. I thought I will take a quick uh, stop there and I just want to take an opportunity to ask both of you, Tim and Samo, if you had to give one top you know stock pick right now, which stock you think is a winner, which would would it be? Maybe we can start with you, uh, Samo. Wow. Okay. So, uh, I I mean, as in, if, if it's me, I I'm I'm definitely more of a more of one that likes to go with the crowd, and I like to look at valuations. So I I mean, as in, where if like the stock prices have come off a lot, uh, I I feel that it may be interesting to look at it. So actually, I know that my view may not tally very much with him, but I'm actually looking towards uh Tencent being one of uh that uh sort of like one that has growth opportunities, given it has come off quite a bit and right now close to its support levels. Yep. So aside from that, I mean, as in, in terms of the growth story, a lot of the key regulations have come out for Tencent, meaning to say, like example, those targeting the gaming sector. And recently, we, we can see that uh, Tencent has followed in terms of the directions that the Chinese government is going towards, like your common prosperity, like example, uh, cooperating with Alibaba in terms of launching its uh, WeChat pay on Alibaba's platforms. And all of these are in adherence to the Chinese policies or the Chinese uh, methodologies that they want to push forward. And this actually will give uh, Tencent some uh, growth prospects going forth as well. And I like the 
the diversity of its business in terms of the media business coming in from the advertising, coming in from its gaming models. And so uh, that's why I'm looking towards that. And given that it's quite a big name and a lot of the fund houses are actually vested into it, it does still seem uh, like uh, it has growth opportunities to me. All right, thank you, Sam. Uh, Tim, what about you? Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, before I go, and I, I, I would agree with Samuel. I mean, I actually, um, I would agree on Samuel's point about uh, Tencent uh, from the tech giants. I, I wrote an article today, actually, you know, I'm not a fan of them in general, but I think if I had to pick one, uh, it would be Tencent because I think it's a much stronger business than Alibaba. It's much more diversified. Uh, and I think management is, uh, you know, much more, um, much more competent. So I, I yeah, I, I think, you know, from that perspective, that's an interesting uh, pick. Um, for me, uh, I, I'm a yeah a bit a bit different to to Samuel's uh, sort of take. I I like to focus on areas that are uh, you know maybe a bit less big um, because if they're less big in terms of their market cap, I think the, the growth opportunities are much more exciting. If you hold it over you know maybe three five years, ten years, the longer the better. If they keep winning, right? And so my top pick is is a company called Wuxi Biologics. Um, the ticker there is 2269. Uh, it's listed, yeah, listed in Hong Kong, obviously. Uh, but what it is effectively is it's, you know, sort of an end-to-end -end integrated um, technology platform for biologics drug development. So if you think about all the biotechs now that are developing drugs, you know, I mean, you see Moderna and you see Pfizer, but those guys are huge, right? Um, so they do all the testing, maybe in-house Pfizer probably does the testing. So you have to go through phase one, phase two, phase three trials, and then you have to manufacture the actual drug as well. So there's a lot of different um, hurdles that these guys have to cross in terms of regulation and testing to, to actually get this drug to market, right? It takes a lot of, of time, money, and effort. Um, and a lot of these biotechs, they actually don't have the, the in-house capabilities to do that. So what they tend to do is they tend to outsource that to uh, a contract and development manufacturing organization, uh, also known as a CDMO. And these guys, um, this is what Wuxi Biologics is. It's the leader in this space. So it basically tests... Um, drugs for all these biotechs globally. And so what I love about this name is that it's actually a global business. It's the leader. I mean, it's, it is the leader in its space. It is like the TSMC of its space. It basically, it doesn't differentiate between clients because it will take on any clients that want to test drugs, right? So they don't have, if you want to bet on this explosive growth in biotech, if you believe in, you know, what Kathy was talking about, about CRISPR, like genetics, all this therapeutics, these types of things, this exciting sort of frontier of medicine, you're looking at Wuxi Biologics as the best sort of um, picks and shovels name to do that because it, it doesn't bet on a drug. It just basically tests everything. And what they've done is they've managed to build an unbelievable ecosystem and it's generating you know, exceptional growth. So in 2000, in the first half of this year, they grew revenue at nearly 130% year on year. Um, their contracted backlog is about 12.5 billion. So I mean, they are growing um, super fast and they have made a name for themselves in that sector. Um, it's not really a well-known name, but if you are in that area or in that space, you will know them. Um, but their market cap is around 50 billion, 55 billion US. It's, it's not that big, right? So if you think about, could this company be a $500 billion company in 10 years? I, I definitely think so. I definitely think it could be a, you know, a 10 bagger in 10 years. Um, so that excites me. And the best thing about it, 50% of revenue from North America, 25% from Europe, 25% from China. So really well diversified uh, and growing growing like mad. So that's a very interesting uh, company you just mentioned because I myself am not quite familiar with that name. So thank mm -hmm. you very much, Tim. And uh, let's, get back to, uh, let's get back to the news impacting China and Hong Kong this year, which there has been a lot of. Over to you, Sam. Thanks, Pingmi. So definitely, I mean, as in, if you are observing the markets, uh, these five key teams will be definitely one that people will be noticed. But I'll just give you a brief summary on what is it, as well as how it's going to impact markets going forward. So first is about the regulatory concerns. I, I mean, as in, we can saw the huge sell-off in global industries over the past few months due to this, because of it uh, having a lot, uh, generating a lot of market uncertainty. However, it, the things have since calmed down, and the policies generating out from that has maybe more long-term impact, which I will explain later. Second is the Evergrande credit crisis, which right now is dominating the news headlines. So people are worried uh, that it will have a cymatic risk because it's going to not only uh, impact Evergrande, but maybe the other property companies in Hong Kong as well. 
and as well as the financial companies in Hong Kong. And that's why people are looking very closely at it. Right now, its development is still uh, relatively uh, unstable and it's still dominating the headlines these few days. Thirdly, is the China power shortage situation that is ongoing. I mean, as in, this has resulted in a number of factories to close in China in terms of not shutting its operations completely, but stopping its operations temporarily because right now they do not have power to operate because this is due to China actually uh, cutting its coal uh, power plants because of its carbon initiative. And we can see Sino-US relations that uh, has some positivity over the past few days. And lastly, the COVID resurgence. That is not only a China affair, but it's a global affair. And if it's going to impact the COVID, the reco economic recovery globally, people will be worried about that. So we can see that the recent uh, developments in China uh, acts as a two-edged sword as well, and people are looking towards it to see uh, which they prefer. Definitely, there's positive and negative towards uh, what China is doing. And the positives are that the measures are actually focusing on China having sustainable growth going forth. So whether is it anti-monopoly laws or the increased regulation, it's all to help China's internet internationalization efforts. And it's to level the playing field for SMEs to help SMEs grow in China. So we can see maybe like the next giant uh, emerging from China. Like maybe you can see a next Tencent, etc. because it does not kill competition. The common prosperity is also due to improved national uh, demographics in the long run. However, the negative side of all of these regulations is that the sudden regulatory changes have sparked much market uncertainty. We all know that as investors, we do not like uh, huge uncertainty. We like something to be stable and we know what we are investing in. But with all of these sudden changes over the past few months, people are, are getting worried because they do not know what to expect. So it can also result in near-term profit declines for companies. Like example, you can see that uh, with the restrictions on the e-gaming side, and with the restrictions on uh, coal power plants, you can see that it has affected uh, factory operations as well as it has affected some of the re gaming revenue. Also, we can see that there has been, due to these regulations, it could result in more companies becoming partially state-owned. So you can see more SOE companies, which is not what people want to see. So like example, you can see like uh, for your Alibaba, it's uh, payment, uh, sort of like the pay, payment company that wanted to IPO, eventually right now is going to be partially state-owned. Also, the reforms have resulted in lesser M&A recently due to the uncertainty. So with that, we can see that actually it depends on how you view it. It's always two sides. If you view it positively, you, feel you will look at long-term growth story. If you view it negatively, then definitely you will, you will be looking at the short-term uncertainty. So there's no right or wrong to investing, and it depends on how your view is, and you have to stick to your view because it will be your driving force in terms of investment. So I'll just share a little bit of the, the sectors picked by some of our, our CGI, uh, CGS, CIMB uh, research team. So we can see for the property sector, they are actually quite uh, negative on it because they feel that the tighter regulations will remain. I mean, right now for the property sector, two key uh, policies are in place. One is housing for living, not speculation. And second is the three rate lines policy. So with that in mind, it's actually to, con to actually control property prices and to ensure that these property companies do not over leverage. All right. However, our research team is actually more bullish a little bit on the property management sector, whereby they manage the properties for people like your service apartments or your malls, etc. So they are looking towards country garden services and shima services as their topic. And we are looking, the next sector is the high-end manufacturing sector, and it's going to drive future growth. Because right now, what China is doing is that they are actually looking at self-integration, like I explained earlier. So they're looking to support sectors such as new energy vehicles and semiconductors, and as well as accelerate the integration of e-commerce and logistic distribution system. So this will definitely benefit uh, your TMT place, like example, your ZTE and SMIC. Also, they are, uh, our research team is actually quite looking towards the industrial side and they are quite bullish on that sector. Why? It's because currently right now, the Chinese government is very focused towards reducing carbon emissions. And this has been one of its key focus in its five-year plan itself. There have not only been enforcement of dual energy consumption controls, there's also been potential supply side disruptions, which is beneficial for the upstream names. So we are looking at your raw manufacturer producers, like example, your Sing E-Glass, which actually produces, which actually is part of 
uh, produces the raw material for the solar panels, as well as your China Tower, which is actually uh, has a large part of its business doing with uh, charging stations in China itself. So this is where the green part comes into play and people will be looking towards that in terms of the industrial sector. Lastly, is the internet sector that I think that many of us are all interested in because uh, we are always looking at Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, etc. So what happens is that our analysts are actually feeling that restrictions will remain for this sector. However, they feel that it's time to turn more positive on the platform economy because of the, recent, the huge recent sell-off and with the data privacy rules already implemented, they feel that uh, there may be some growth story to uh, some of these big names that have more, that have better sort of like uh, asset classes as well as business growth model. So they're looking towards Tencent and JD.com. Also, if you're looking at the internet sector, definitely people will be looking at the gaming sector as well. And what happens is that with the China's uh, policy shift, to shift interest from gaming to sports, it will definitely benefit the sports equipment sector, like what Tim have been stating just now, whereby it's pushing people to wear exercise and have more sports uh, programs, etc. So we are looking at leaning and anti sports to benefit from them. All right, so I'll pass it on to Tim. Thanks, Samuel. Um, I think I'll just wrap up um, my take. So I wrote an article on this, uh, you know, last month. Um, sort of on, on the crackdown uh, on the Chinese education sector. Um, I would just highlight, you know, that the, the whole no profit allowed, like effectively banning profit is just confined to online education. So the other sectors, there is just increased regulation. So there are no wall gardens, you know, fair markets, open competition, which I think um, as Samuel, you know, sort of pointed out is gonna be good for, you know, SMEs, for the smaller players the medium sized players. Um, there won't be so much consolidation. There won't be so many acquisitions. You know, you've already seen a couple of these acquisitions be uh, sort of nipped in the bud by regulators. I think, you know, the the, the Huya and like um, the other gaming platform, stream platform that Tencent wanted to acquire and merge, that, that, that's been stopped. Um, you know, Tencent Music's been ordered to, I think, you know, give up some of the rights for its music. So I think there is going to be some um, more action you know on on sort of the on the monopoly side of things because i think in a lot of areas in china there's too much monopolistic behavior uh, and i think that would be negative for obviously the big guys the big platforms uh, longer term um, but it depends on you know how the margins play out but i i think if you own 80 90 percent of a market and then the government says you can't own that amount anymore then i tend to see that inevitably the margins will come down at some point so that's why i'm negative on big tech in China longer term. Um, and, you know, I think the B2B space is really interesting. A lot, there's a lot of cloud players starting to come to the fore. Um, it's still early days in China in the cloud ecosystem compared to the US. You don't see as many tier two tech kind of giants like you do maybe, you know, Adobe or Salesforce in the US. But I think as the market becomes more mature in China, you'll see more of these cloud productivity software players um, that aren't owned by the big tech guys, I think they will start to um, sort of, you know, they, they would start to become more obvious. So I think I'm looking out for that to happen over the next three, five, 10 years. Um, because B2B is an, it's an interesting one because I think the government wants productivity to be raised uh, with, a, with a falling birth rate. Um, you need labor productivity to improve. And one of the best ways to do that is through, um, is through SaaS and tech, so, and cloud. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's it for me. I think uh, we would like to actually get the audience here today uh, to fill up this poll. Would you still invest in China tech? I mean, we all know this is a really trending topic right now and there's been so much conversation about it and we read so much news about it. So I think uh, it'd be interesting to see what the audience uh, thinks. I mean, for me personally, I'm no market expert like Tim or, or Samuel, uh, but you know, I, I would say I'm sitting on the fence with China tech as well. I, I've never been very comfortable picking stocks uh, when it comes to China and Hong Kong. So what I've done is put a little bit of money into both ETFs and funds. So I'm happy to have a little bit of exposure so that you know, in the long run, you know, if uh, the China tech sector continues to grow, then hopefully I get a nice you know, a return on investment. At the same time, I probably you know, diversify my risk a little bit since I don't have that, you know, level of confidence in the picking stocks. Yeah. All right, I think we've got most of the responses in, so I'm just going to flesh it up. 
All right. So I think uh, 62% uh, have said yes, and 32% are unsure, and uh, only 6% have said no. Mm. Interesting. Interesting, interesting. Well, I guess the, the, the size of uh, you know, the China market and the fact that the, the technology companies have grown significantly, you know, mm. I, I guess you know, from, a, from a profitability angle, I think there's a certain you know, uh, confidence that the companies will get there. Right? It's just, I guess, a question of timing. Yeah. All right, I think uh, we are uh, running out of time. So let's quickly run through. I think there's one last slide for you, Tim. Oh, okay. I didn't realize it was. Okay. I thought we were done. <laughs> Okay, one more for me. Oh, okay, yeah. So the slowdown in China, um, you know, isn't isn't helping. I think uh, some of these uh, some of these tech guys. You know, we've seen Evergrande, the crisis, um, home prices coming down. But I think um, you know, I think it's quite well contained. But it's going to be something that needs to be watched. I think the Evergrande crisis won't be a systemic issue, but. It's something that the Chinese government obviously wants to uh, manage in a controlled fashion. Uh, you know, they, they like to have control. So I think this is something that they will be controlling and overseeing and making sure that it doesn't cause too many issues for the economy. But it is something to monitor um, for, for investors. Um, yeah, that's it for me. All right. Thanks, Tim. So yeah. I think I'll just end off with a little bit about how to invest into Hong Kong. All right. So... Ever since we have covered so much, there are definitely a few ways to invest into Hong Kong uh, via either the equities or ETFs. So I know that uh, Tim is not a fan of ETFs, but nonetheless, I'll just explain the two various methods. So equities is buying to the company itself and definitely you can profit from both capital appreciation and dividends. So if you want to buy into uh, Hong Kong equities, definitely you can do so via the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. And if you want to buy into Chinese equities, you can do so via the Stock Connect. For ETFs, they actually track the performance of an index and it's effective in gaining exposure to a basket of equities. So definitely, if you are not comfortable doing stock pick, if you are not familiar with uh, the exact stocks, you may want to start with an ETF because it will give you a wider uh, array of companies and it reduces the single counter exposure. So it can be used to start in investing in unfamiliar markets, like example, Hong Kong markets or Chinese markets. And there's a definitely a huge array of ETFs available as seen here that track both the Hang Seng Index, the Hang Seng Tech Index, the A50, or even the CSI 300. All right. And so I'll just end off with this last slide to show you what is the definition of Hong Kong markets. And it's just like what Tim explained just now. Uh, the trading lots are not fixed and the minimum bid size is dependent on share prices. And the trading hours is from 9.30 to 4 o'clock, unlike Singapore's 9 to 5. So uh, settlement timing is also slightly less, uh, lesser than that of Singapore. With that, I think I'll pass the time on back to Pingyi. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think that was a very, very insightful session. Uh, we've definitely taken more time than we thought we would because I think there's just so much to come up. Uh, we'll quickly jump through the uh, Q&A. There is quite a lot of questions today. I think uh, this is one of our more active sessions. I think we also had uh, we also had one participant who raised his hand. Uh, James Quack, just want to check. Um, do you wanna uh, do you wanna share with us your question? No. Okay, maybe not. Uh, then uh, to the team, can we flash out the rest of the Q and A that's coming? Right, uh, why, why is that capital flow into Hong Kong, but the Hong Kong stocks have been falling for this past few months? So perhaps, um, Samuel, would you take this question? Sure, definitely think me. So why is that so? It's mainly because we, if you are looking at it, it's actually the whole world is actually falling. It's not only just Hong Kong, but you see even the US as well as China, they have both uh, saw uh, huge declines due to the fact that there was a, uh, this major uncertainty due to regulatory risk. And I think it's unfair to say that, oh, funds are coming in, but uh, the market is falling. It's maybe because there are some, there are, there are some of the HD players that are actually taking profit from it, but the funds are actually not leaving Hong Kong, meaning to say that there is opportunity for them to reinvest in markets when they feel that uh, there is better timing from there. So with that in mind, we are looking towards if there are more inflows in markets, 
definitely meaning to say that going forth, there may be still more upside potential from there. Yeah. All right. Uh, can we move on to the next question? All right. There were news that China is moving its financial hub from Hong Kong to elsewhere. Doesn't that mean Hong Kong stock has no hope? All right, uh, Tim, would you like to comment on this? Because you do have uh, hmm. quite a bit of views on the, the financial sector, yeah. specifically banks in Hong Kong. Right, so um, I think if they're talking about the Hong Kong market versus Shanghai and Shenzhen, I think that's the question, right? It's, it's mainly as a, as a hub or a financial hub for it. Um, I think, you know, for Hong Kong, the key that is still keeping it as a core component of the uh, market, you know, for, for global capital is that, um, you know, the, the, there's no control over capital flows. Effectively, there can be as much money flowing into Hong Kong and out of Hong Kong as, as, as you like, you know. And so I think that gives the city a lot more autonomy than the mainland because the mainland has caps on how much can flow out you know how much you can, uh, how many, how much money you can withdraw for for Chinese citizens, and then also there are caps on how much you can get, yeah put into sort of Chinese stocks in mainland China. Um, so longer term, I think there's still the competitive edge for Hong Kong, uh, especially as they've set up this whole stock connect. You know this this is basically to allow international investors to buy into China via Hong Kong. Um, so I don't think there is going to be any movement in that unless the Chinese government gives up control of their currency. Um, and if they give up control of their currency, you know, something else has got to give. Uh, and the Chinese government loves, loves, like actually loves control. So I don't see the Chinese government giving up control of something which they're too scared to give up control of. Um, and if that means that they're open to the vicissitudes of global markets, uh, I think that terrifies them. So I don't think they will open that. So Hong Kong will continue to be uh, the hub into, into China. All right. Thank you, Tim, for, for the response. Yep. Um, next question, please. How would the recent China property Evergrande crisis and Fastasia's default event affect Hong Kong stock market? I think this has been touched on slightly earlier uh, by Samuel. Do you want to elaborate further? All right, sure. So I, I mean that say the Fantasia uh, default is uh, happening right now, whereby people are looking towards it affecting the property management sector. So we can see that over the past two days, the property, sorry, the property development sector in Hong Kong. So we can see over the past two days, the property development sector in Hong Kong actually faced uh, quite a lot of headwinds and there were declines in many of the property developers. This is unsurprising because uh, what happens is that people are worried that eventually it will spark uh, maybe an industry-wide crisis. But that being said, I, I mean as in, uh, the Chinese government actually do have some uh, supports, I, I mean in terms, of, in terms of measures in place, whereby people are looking towards maybe the China government will relax certain rules to ensure that more that it will actually resolve the crisis in this uh, property development sector. So actually our CGSCIMB research team have just published a note yesterday. We state that uh, Chinese government as well as the bank, the various bank officials are actually uh, having meetings twice a week for the past few weeks to actually discuss whether they want to reduce in terms of the loan ratio as well as to ensure that uh, there's enough uh, liquidity for the banks to loan to this company such that these companies can stay afloat. And I think that uh, this will be something to look at. Okay, thank you for the answer. Um, next question. What is your view on Hong Kong land and dairy farm? So Samuel or Tim, either of you want to comment on uh, these two companies? Um, Tim? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm not, as I think I kind of alluded to, I'm not a big fan of, of property developers in Singapore, Hong Kong. So I think the business models are like sort of antiquated. Um, dairy farm, uh, it's a bit of an old school retailer. I don't think it's really innovated much. And you kind of seen that in the, in the um, returns, uh, the business isn't performing that great. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not a huge fan. And liquidity for both names in Singapore is not 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 great. Um, so 
Uh, I think they were kind of businesses of the 2000s. You know, they were like Jardine, uh, sort of like led, you know, they were the sweethearts of 2000s, but um, I think they're a business of the past. So yeah, I'm not a fan. Okay. Um, Samuel, anything to add on? If not, we can uh, go to the next question. I, I think we can go to the next question because both of the stocks are actually listed in Singapore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, ah, yes, this is the one where we had three questions asking about Ping An. Is it a good time to buy? And you know, I think uh, you know we all know that. I think there's been quite a bit of movement in the Ping An uh, prices, right? So I think the fact that we're getting you know, quite a few questions on this uh, shows that there's a lot of uh, investor interest. Yeah. Uh, Samuel, do you want to take this? All right. Maybe I can take it first because recently our research team did publish an article on Ping An. So I'll just uh, share with you the key points of the research. All right, so Ping An Insurance, right now our research team feels that there's a close to 50% upside still because the, share, the current share prices actually declined due to exposure of the Chinese property developers is overdone. So you must understand that less than 5% of Ping An Insurance investments are in Chinese developers and Ping An's real estate exposure has reduced its uh, exposure in Chinese developers 22% year on year. So right now, 10% of its bank loans, even though it's to property developers, which is the second highest among uh, the coverage list by our research team, but it's noted that it's under Ping An Bank, not under Ping An Insurance. So there's also no exposure to Evergrande, uh, Lang Kuang, or Ocean White, which is actually deemed as the more risky uh, uh, property companies by Ping An Insurance itself. Our Research team is actually bullish on Ping An Insurance because they feel it's trading at a record low of PE value 0.54%. And the PE and PV values are looking inexpensive based on the historic basis. So it's also trading uh, 1.2 sta standard deviations below its post-2010 mean. On the insurance sector, our research team uh, top pick is AIA, but the second top pick is Ping An Insurance. So I mean, if those interested in Ping An, maybe can uh, consider it from a value perspective point of view. Tim? Yeah, I would, um, I would say um, I actually used to own Ping An, but I kind of turned a bit more bearish on it uh, earlier this year because I think they are being used um, as they're a massive company. They're sort of, you know, considered too big to fail kind of in the insurance space in China. They're ubiquitous, they're everywhere. Um, and they had to sort of bail out Fortune Land or inject money into Fortune Land. Um, so I, I think you're starting to see the Chinese government use them a bit more um, to, to control certain things in the economy or to, you know, sort of bail out, bail out institutions that are, I think Fortune Land was a, was a failing property developer. Um, so when you see that, I'm a bit wary because you're seeing the Chinese, you know, the, the invisible hand of the CCP kind of uh, guide the business to do things that it shouldn't be doing. Um, and because it's so big, they can do that, right? So I, that's why I prefer AIA because AIA is not that big uh, in China. It's pretty small. Government's not going to be making them do anything. Um, and I kind of just lost patience with uh, Ping An. It's, a, it's actually a solid business, but it's just traded sideways for like five years and it's really not done anything. Um, and uh, I think, you know, it's, it's cheap, but again, I think it's starting to be cheap for a reason because I think um, going forward, you're going to see uh, the Chinese government maybe start to use them to um, to bail out more more for uh, property developers or to to patch things over, right? So I think for me that's a no no as a as a shareholder. All right, um, thank you for your views. Um, I mean, Ping An Insurance is signed. I think there's another listed Ping An Healthcare and Technology, which also has seen its uh, stock price come down significantly. Are your views the same as well? Because they're part of the whole Ping An group. I actually like that company. Um, I actually really like Ping On Healthcare. Um, it's loss making, but you know, I'm what can I say? I'm like a, a growth guy. I like I like things that are going to make a difference in the in sort of in either the society or the world. And so um, they've taken a battering, I think, on data data privacy. Um, same with JD Health and Ali Health. Um, but I think from a perspective of big tech, they're not as threatening as like an Ali Health or JD Health because they're not big tech. Ping On Ping On is still like financial, um, but they've got a tech slant to it. Um, and Ping On Good Doctor, their approach is a bit different to the other two. You know, they're focusing a bit more on like internet hospitals, on, uh, you know, remote healthcare, on the whole sort of um, remote uh, sort of 
you know, experience for healthcare end to end healthcare. Whereas the other guys are really big on drug delivery, you know, JD and Alibaba. So the, the models are a bit different. So I think longer term, um, I'm still, I still like that. I still hold that personally um, as a company, but I'm not buying on this dip just because I think there's still a lot of uncertainty uh, in that space, but I, I do like what they're doing. And I think it's doing the right thing for the Chinese. Uh, I think the government will like what they're doing longer term. Okay. Um, we're not done with Ping'an because another question just uh, slipped in. If Ping'an has an upside of 47%, but your stock pick is Tencent. So I think this question is for you, Samuel. Are you suggesting that Tencent has more upside than Ping'an? I mean, as in, it depends on the sector because end of the day, I, I'm still quite bullish on the tech. So even though if you're looking at the insurance sector that may have upside potential, etc., it really depends personally on uh, which sector you feel have more growth in going forth. So I personally prefer the tech side and I feel that the tech side uh, sell-off is quite huge as well. So I mean, if you are looking whether Tencent will have that huge uh, upside, I personally do not think so. Okay, I, I mean as in I'm more realistic in that in that aspect, but I feel that the upside will be significant enough for me to put my money uh, to invest in it in the long run as well. But if you're looking at more other stocks, then definitely when we are looking at diversification of portfolio, I'll definitely look at Pingan or even AIA, whereby the insurance sector is still very interesting to look at. Even like just now when you're talking about like Pingan Good Doctor or Ali Health, etc., I feel that uh, that sector is also a growth sector going forth because it will help actually to transform the healthcare scene in China. And China has been very focused on the pharmaceutical and healthcare scene and with more measures in place to regulate and better improve that sector. Right, thank you very much for your views. Uh, what's the next uh, question that we have? All right, is Alibaba price bottoming up after today's search? Let Samuel say that. <laughs> this is like more of a technical analysis question. Yeah. I, I, I mean, as in, in terms of bottoming up, it's very hard to say. I think today's uh, search is mainly because of Warren Buffett's, uh, it, I, I mean, it's due to one of a uh, very uh, high, high net worth investor that has bought into it. So because of that, people are thinking that, oh, because this uh, huge big boys are buying into Alibaba, will it be a recovery story? But personally, I, I feel that in terms of uh, Alibaba, and what our research team feels is that there's still some more headwinds in Alibaba because of the fact that not only is it uncertain in terms of its growth story, we can see that it's actually the main target of uh, the, retail, the retail sector in terms of the Chinese government's urge and e policy, meaning uh, the anti-monopoly policy. Because right now, what happens is that a lot of these Chinese companies, uh, they are forcing people to buy using their platform. And we can see that Alibaba and Meituan has been one of the most badly hit by the regulations. And this ongoing case is not resolved yet. And I still feel that there may be uh, some uncertainty, personally. So I, I'm not, if like stated, in terms of the tech sector, I prefer Tencent as, as compared to maybe like Alibaba, etc. I think it's a similar view to what Tim has been saying as well. Thank you very much. Uh, we are running out of time, so we do have quite a few questions to go through, but in the interest of time, we'll just take one, uh, one last question. Okay, is the education sector a good buy now? All right, I think no. this does tie oh. back to the regulatory crackdown we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Tim, question. you want to go first? Yeah, no, that, that's my short answer. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> no, it's not a good buy. Because they're um, not supposed to be profitable I, businesses, yeah, right? Yeah, it, it's uh, if you if you ban profit, uh, it doesn't tend to be a, a you know positive for uh, for the companies or the stock prices. I think I read somewhere that some of these Chinese education online education uh, names are uh, trading below like the value of their net cash. So kind of tells you that people basically have no hope for this sector. Um, whether that's going to change and, you know, miraculously Xi Jinping is going to let them come back and, and do what they want. Like, um, I, I wouldn't bet on it. So uh, I, I would say no. <laughs> All right. And uh, Samuel? Personally, I, I'm not a fan of the education sector right now as well, uh, because this has actually happened in the past before in terms of the ban, whereby actually we're looking at five years back. There was a ban in China for the pre the kindergarten sector, whereby similar rules were, were put in place and they were actually uh, not allowed to sort of like 
advertise or sort like make profit, etc. Because they wanted to control the pricing of the kindergarten sector back in China. So uh, since then, those listed those stocks, those kindergarten stocks that were listed in the US has uh tumbled, and after that, they have remained low. And from then until now, there was no not much upside growth story. And so I think that similarly, we may be looking at the same at the education sector as a whole in China right now. And I'm not a fan of it right now as well. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Samuel and Tim. And I think that will be the end for tonight. For the questions we weren't able to answer, we apologize, uh, but we have overrun by almost half an hour. So thank you, everyone. And uh, yes, before you leave, uh, please do complete the survey on your way out. And thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.